African-American legends highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, education, film, and theater. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining me on today's program are the legendary Ossie Davis and Ruby D. <laughs> Good friends, and Ruby and Ozzie, how does it feel to be a legend? Awful. Well, yes, I tell you, I, I can't accept it, it's a, that, that designation, a legend, when it looks, when it seems, it's something one looks back on, I think. I think about legends and statues going together. And you know what happens to statues, don't you, after a while? <laughs> yeah, the birds mess with them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, oh, but uh, the, the reason that I, I might have an objection to the use of legend is that we live in a time where the difference between one generation and another is great and growing wider and we don't need even those lovely phrases if the end result of the phrase is to further separate us from the young folks mm -hmm. I don't mind being a legend but people look at a legend and they put you out of their lives. I know I'm still here. There are a lot of things I want to do, so let's leave the legend stuff off for the time being and deal with each other about the problem we face. Yeah, yes. That's probably the reason why I keep running marathons, so that they won't catch up with me. <laughs> exactly. Um, over the years that you two have been in show business, mm -hmm. as it were, things have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, how have they changed most for African Americans? Well, I would say they've changed most, uh, maybe in terms of visibility, uh, in terms of uh, access to opportunities that we didn't have before. Uh, speaking about the profession in which we are involved, uh, the theater and films and television, when we came along, uh, there were not many job opportunities, there were not many uh, actors available, I mean, there were not many roles available for. Uh, African -American now, was performers. that because the roles were stereotypic roles for blacks, like being a maid or a waiter? Partially, Or yes. is it because the general public wasn't aware, willing to be aware of the fact that African Americans play roles like anybody else, ranging from <laughs> bankers to doctors to bus drivers? Well, I, I think the one is tighter with the other. Uh, I think the American public, <clears throat> led by uh, those who uh, create uh, public opinion, uh, didn't really want to face uh, the fact that we were human beings because there were certain consequences that flowed from that or that should flow from that that they weren't ready to deal with. It was best from their point of view not to rattle the boat to keep black folks back there so that you don't have to do you got other things on your mind. So a part of that I think led to the kind of writing that excluded us or misrepresented us and the kind of presentation that excluded and misrepresented us. Hmm. But was, now, mm -hmm. for example, you've been writing, in, you've written several books, but writing a new book about just how we feel about ourselves. Now more people are willing to hear that. Is that because there are more African Americans watching TV, you know, we watch more TV than yeah. anybody else, or is it because the whole society, white, black, Latino, wants to know about us? I haven't done a study on it, Roscoe, to tell you the truth. And I'm, and I'm one of these people sometimes loathe to make generalities as if I'm an expert on, on the subject. I speak from this narrow perspective um, of myself as I've been able to observe. And as I read, I'm recently rereading, for example, Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks. That was written in 1903. 1903. I yes, read that periodically. That uh, my soul. And <laughs> as I read it, but for a little, it could almost apply mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So the degree of change is is too slight, I feel, for the for the journey mm -hmm. that we as human beings have to make in terms of our, of our relationships to each other. Uh, that's qualitatively. Quantitatively, I think there's a there is a higher visibility because there are more people in the world and there are more of us. Mm -hmm. But the racist principles are still in effect. 
I wish I could say otherwise. And, and, all, and as I reflect if, um, on writers, for instance, like Jackie Robinson, like Sammy Davis Jr., like um, Lena the Horn. stories of Lena Horne, I like the Anne the, the, the Ann Petries, uh, writers like that. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I um, see, them, see that they're not, that the story has not, mm -hmm. has not changed that much. It's, I never had it made uh, from Jackie. Why me? From, I mean, all of them uh, talk about the same racism that has existed since we've been in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's a little disturbing. Qu qu there are more of us. And certainly things, I love the fact that, uh, I love Alfre as an actor, mm -hmm. Alfre Woodard and, and Angela Bassett and all the mm -hmm. new uh, people that are coming along as actors. There, and Denzel, and, and they're marvelously talented, and they're, so I'm pleased to see that change. But I'm a little dismayed when you can count all such people on two hands, maybe. That's true. <laughs> could, I just, could I jump into mm -hmm. that? I, I think uh, there has been changes, and a part of it is due to the fact that we, who were invisible, according to Ralph Ellison, for the longest time, mm. by our own action, by our own capacity to agitate, agitate, forced ourselves on the public's attention. Well, assuming that America had a concept of us in the old days which left us out altogether, then all of a sudden here we come on stage, then America says, well, they certainly ain't who I thought they were, but then who are they? So, so, so there is a hunger and a curiosity but at the same time, America still doesn't want to open the door too wide. You've got to face your way in even when the door is open to crack. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking about, I grew up in the 30s, mm -hmm. and uh, Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis, Paul Robeson mm -hmm. were my heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, Je Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis got more public acclamation from the white community mm -hmm. because it was in athletics, whereas Paul was in theater and human rights and civil rights and so mm -hmm. on. And I was just wondering what has changed today that allows us to have heroes and heroines like uh, the late Barbara Jordan or like uh, Carol Mosley Carol mm -hmm. Braun. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Colin Powell, Constance mm -hmm. Bigham, people Motley. who are not mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. in the athletic range, mm -hmm. and then of course people like uh, Ozzie and Ruby, who cut across the spectrum. <laughs> you are <laughs> both known as to. much as civil <laughs> rights leaders mm -hmm. and opinion form makers mm -hmm. as you are outstanding actors and actresses. Mm -hmm. Now, what has changed around that? Well, uh, one of the things that's changed has been that the world and its expectations into which we came had an assignment to which all of us had to respond. Paul Robeson, uh, uh, Jesse Owen, uh, Joe Lewis, uh, Ruben Arce, and all of us, uh, there was always the question of racism, always the question of we are not free. We were born into the struggle whether we wanted to or not, and each victory we made was not only a score on the board, it was also a token mm -hmm. for our inclusion. When Jackie Robinson hit the ball out of the park, mm -hmm. we it was all, more than a ball. We all were lifted mm -hmm. by that. When Joe Lewis now, knocked out Max Mellon, exactly. we were all. We were all there. Now, uh, what, uh, one of the things that's changed is that the very success of our struggle in getting, making ourselves visible and putting laws to protect our rights on the books has changed the nature of the struggle, and a lot of young people today are born into a world where that sense of struggle is not there. Therefore, they wander around because history has not given them the assignment, or they don't know That's it. that the assignment is there. Yeah, Ruby so. and I still know that the assignment is still there. The fight still goes on. Struggle is the definition of our lives. Mm -hmm. We got to help the young folks mm -hmm. understand you know, that their success, and what, when they hit the ball out of the park, they too 
must be striking a blow against mm. a common enemy. I, I think when I think about this word leadership and what 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 uh, the, the the capacity of young folks to struggle in the same ways, I think they know a great deal more and sense a great deal more than we uh, than we suspect because. I, I, I do believe that uh, when a, le a leader, when you call the leader, when one a component of leader leadership is power, and um, Martin Luther King, neither Martin nor Malcolm nor <laughs> had the kind of power to affect change, and they, and the kids are looking at that, and they had the power to get themselves killed. They're saying, so oh, these people they come into our. So I I, I think that that's uh, that we have to really examine uh, when I think about Martin with power to change things, and he wasn't able to do that. I, uh, they, we weren't. Our leaders are those people we elect and are responsible. We can kick them out of office. We expect things from them. But our the the kind of leadership that we even to accept, accept the word leader, black leaders, uh, until they are, are capable of affecting change, and has been the case in some rare incident instance, instances. But I think we really have to look at that concept of leader, leader, and leadership. And I think young people, are, they have, they might not might not know the, by by word and jot and tittle, hmm? but they see the effect. But see, this is one of the beautiful things about history and talking about it and living it. As you know, I was a Tuskegee Airman, mm -hmm. Tuskegee Airman, black yeah. pilots in World War II. We we broke the the shibboleth that said that blacks couldn't fly, mm -hmm. and we did it in the best possible way with the most outstanding fighter group in the 15th Air Force. Mm -hmm. The movies and the documentaries about that now are coming to these young people. It's just amazing where I go somewhere and they say Tuskegee Airmen, they get up and they applaud and so on because they understand that we broke a barrier. Mm -hmm. They understand that Ansi and Ruby broke barriers. Mm -hmm. They also understand that collectively we make a contribution to the movement. Mm -hmm. And you two in particular are always there when there's a struggle. Uh, to be fought, uh, your legendary, it is legendary, <coughs> <laughs> eulogy for Malcolm mm -hmm. is just so well known and so well appreciated. Mm -hmm. Your uh, aphorism, it's mm -hmm. not the it's not rap, the man. but the map, yeah. it's not the man, but the plan. Right. And if our folks can internalize that every day, mm -hmm. we would make a lot of struggle, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of progress. Let me talk about show business. Uh, Ruby D, you're a Hunter College graduate of the great city of University of New York. Mm -hmm. How did you get in show business? I, uh, I show business, I, I think about that. I'm really not in it. I'm <coughs> around it. I'm on the periphery. I'm doing all right for a color girl. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, that's being in show business. Uh, you, you see, you know, in these great contests of films and actors, we're not sufficiently represented in, in terms of the, the, the prizes we win, the films that we do, uh, the monies for which we, that we can get to do all kinds of films. We can, we're allowed still to do certain kinds of films. So, would you ask me how I got started? The start is 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 I've, I treasure because it, I started going to the um, the American Negro Theater in Harlem, located in the library on 135th Street, where the Schomburg Center is now, and where I met people with like ambitions, working together. Where I went to school, in a sense, to find out a little bit who I who I was. It was that peripheral education <laughs> that became the the, the 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 bloodstream in my life. And work, uh, and um, th that I'm st still trying to bring center stage, not only in my own life, but in the consciousness of the country. So that's how I got started, and um, I st and I frankly feel a very short distance from the starting line. I think we all do, particularly <laughs> as we get older. What about you, Ozzy? <laughs> well, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to write plays, and one of my professors. Dr. Alain Leroy Locke at Howard University, when he found out what my ambition was, uh, wondered whether I had enough experience in the theater to write plays because he found that I had never seen a play <laughs> in my whole life. So he suggested that, look, when you finish college, go to New York. There's a little group that's starting up called the Rose McClendon Players with Dick Campbell and Muriel Ron. 
uh, tell them I sent you. And if they accept you, get in and act, sing, dance, direct, you know, hustle, lemonade, paint, scenery, do everything you can, then you will learn about the theater and find out ultimately whether you have the qualifications to write for the theater. So I was so excited I didn't stay to graduate. I grabbed the train, <laughs> came to Penn Station. You left Howard University. Left Howard University, <laughs> went to uh, Rose uh, the Dick Campbell, the Rose McClendon Players, a library on 124th Street, joined the group. That's how I got into the business, and uh, I was never able to get out since, <laughs> but that's how I started. Of all the many roles that the two of you have played, which is your favorite? I'll start with you, Ruby. Which is your favorite? Well, I think I like um, Ludabelle Gussie Mae Jenkins because it's a role <laughs> yeah. that my husband created. Not necessarily That's for right. me, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's an in, it's in-house product. I've enjoyed lots of roles. I, I, I'm not an absolutist, so, but that, that one that I treasure true. because it, it was from the, the home shop. Okay, Reverend, mm. what's yours? Well, uh, I have to be <laughs> egotistic on this and say to, I, too, enjoyed more than anything else playing Pearly Victorious, That's right. both on stage and in the, <laughs> the movie that we did. Yeah, that truly was for me. And I, I really yeah. should have said Angel Angelina, a, a, a character that I wrote in a musical called um, Take It From The Top. Yes. I wrote the yeah. musical, mm -hmm. and I'm still hoping someday to get it on again. Um, uh, it's Angel Angelina, I like that role, too. Mm -hmm. Now, both of you worked in Spike Lee's films. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about your, your roles were absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed them. I felt them, first of all, I know you, I felt them. Uh, how do you feel about uh, those roles, what Spike is trying to say and how you are portraying it? Well, uh, let, let, let's first speak about Spike. Okay. Spike is the only director I know that offered me four roles. I was only able to take three, but... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, nobody else keeps coming back says with something job about, opportunities. Says something about access. Uh, yes, yeah. so, uh, so Spike is my man yeah. because he gives me employment. <laughs> Having said that, uh, I'm particularly impressed by Spike, by his energy, by his bravery, by his chutzpah, and by his determination. You know, even as a filmmaker, his imagination and his capacity. What I want for Spike is that he somehow uh, also uh, is, has access to the history and experience that we had coming in. The young folks today do not have access to those memories or to those experiences and therefore they see things slightly differently. I'm not saying that what they see is wrong. What I'm saying is if they saw some of the other dimensions they would give us I think an even more powerful uh, interpretation. I say for example as much as I like Spike's uh, Malcolm X, I want to be here when he comes back 25 years later mm -hmm. and does it again. Does it again. Then he'll know. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Ruby? Uh, about about Sp what? Spike and, uh, oh, and uh, well, the kind Spike of is, things Spike he's is saying. My, he's uh, my role model. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm increasingly, I find myself increasingly going to young people for examples of how to move forward and the things that you want to do and like. And uh, the fact that he, by hook or by, by crook, did, uh, She's Gotta Have It was his first project, that he, he just did it. And I'm, I'm enormously impressed by that because I, I'm, I'm expecting African-American women particularly to begin just such activity to just somehow get the doors kicked open. <laughs> and um, so, so I'm a great admirer, admirer of Spikes. He, he, he's a very young man uh, and um, just being black though just distracts from a kind of philosophical maturity because you don't have time for it, you know. I just, just staying alive uh, and in, in, in a, in a I, I call it a brute way because even in the arts, there's a there's a certain uh, uh, um, there's a certain rugged and ragged and determination uh, that you have to have to move forward. Unfortunately, it's that same kind of thing that you have to have to stay alive. <laughs> so that's why I, I see you empathize <clears throat> very much with young folks, mm -hmm. and I hear it in many of the things that you say. And since we were young once. And we were confronting a different kind of struggle, mm -hmm. a struggle of segregation, even a struggle of humanity. Can black folks be a chemist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can black folks be a lawyer? Can black mm -hmm. folks be a ball player? Can they be a, a fighter pilot? Mm -hmm. 
These young people live in a different world. Mm -hmm. We know we can be all of those things, mm -hmm. but we have the invisible ceiling, the glass ceiling. And then, unfortunately, some of us, some of the young folks have developed some uh, self-defeating behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, part of it out of frustration, and part of it possibly, as you say, out of a lack of knowledge of the history and in terms of how do you move things ahead. Mm -hmm. The program, don't forget, one of the key components of racism is to teach you how to destroy yourself. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, we were continually, we said, well, you, you, these kids are killing each other. We're, we're blaming them mm -hmm. for what, what uh, you see, if we are what we eat, you know, we are, if, if we are the food we eat, we, our children and we are also the images that, that, that feed, that we see constantly from the time we come into this world. We become those images. What can and we do to change that? Yes, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I know you try, but what are some things we can do to change well, that? First of all, I think um, we as, as adults have to look, take a look at ourselves. I think we have to do some backtracking and apologizing. I think we have to uh, do some heavy reaching down, heavy sacrifice stuff. You know, we have to, we have to, we have to pay attention. We have to, and take some hard licks in the process because we had a moment, we had a, an opening where we could have closed the doors against and protected our children, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. We bought into youth, we bought into individuality, we bought into... Uh, Psychedelic drugs what, what, yes, and a lot of things. And, uh, yes, and what is success, and mm -hmm. what... Uh, and we, f we, we abandon our spiritual thrust, which I think... I, I'm, I'm not saying that... But, and we forgot about our children in the important ways. I, I'm not excluding even myself for that. I'm just, I'm feeling that we gave them enough to, to survive on and, to, and enough to grow and build to a different, I look at my daughter now, I, my daughter Nora and my, my mother and Hester, they were marvelous mothers they are in a conscious kind of way. I wasn't conscious as a mother. I was lucky, <laughs> you know. The, 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 these uh, questions and things that we talk about are far more, uh, I, I think that we need to look at them differently. I, we now, as adults, need to lay ourselves out on there. It's, uh, we, need to, we need to rescue our children and our, our youngsters forcefully, well, no matter what it takes, our lives yeah. even. In part, that's what the Million Man March was about. It should have been million men and women, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it was about looking at ourselves, dedicating ourselves mm -hmm. to our community, etc. Mm -hmm. But Ozzy's aphorism comes in, uh, it's not the man, it's the plan. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we haven't done enough planning behind what transpired there. But the words that you have just uttered mm -hmm. uh, reflect the thoughts of many people in my generation and some you know, 15 years younger, mm -hmm. who are really concerned about our youth. Uh, mm -hmm. African-American youth, 40% of them live in poverty, uh, over half of them born to uh, single mothers. Uh, not there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but what does that mean in terms of the structure? What are we doing in our community to help build that structure? And I happen to believe that the arts are one way of helping us to see that and build that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that, Ozzy? No, I, I would agree with that. W one of the problems uh, I think uh, young folks faced, uh, and we weren't able to help them, is that we gave them a world where materialism was the mm -hmm. pervasive value, and we didn't help them and understand how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. y you said a minute ago that uh, now a young man can be anything he wants to, and he can make all of that money. We taught him how to qualify for the money. We haven't taught him what to spend the money for. We have not laid before our young folks a moral assignment that is worthy of their fullest development. We let the commercial uh, mercantile values of the world uh, engage their attention. And around us is a society and a culture that constantly says, Consume, consume, use, do it now. Don't save, don't worry about that. Consume, enjoy, consume. 
you know, and our children. Well, you, who, sometimes you folks help us to do that. Those commercials, you do it really great. I know. You go on, pick up but, the telephone and call your friend. <laughs> but the, the, the point has to be that if I know that I'm doing that, I must then make absolutely sure That's right. that I, I do that for other purposes and other causes. And of course you do, I was joking. To give, but to <laughs> give the young folks a sense of purpose, a sense of destiny, some idea of where we are going, and a better reason for living than the material values is absolutely mm. indispensable. We will come to a halt as a civilization, not mm. only black folks, but whites too, unless we can rise above the material swamp into which we've allowed ourselves to, th to sink. Consume, consume, yeah. consume, eat, nosh, go and b b b mm -hmm. go. No, don't stop, don't think, don't put off till tomorrow, mm -hmm. sex or whatever the urges are. Now, 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 do it now. You know, we've got to change that. I don't know whether you do help with the writing of some of those commercials, but some of those commercials are really good in getting that message across. What are you doing for your family? How are you relating to your family? What are you doing for your community? Mm -hmm. It's almost as though it should be a contract with every performer, ball player, television uh, perf uh, specialist that says, when you get this money, at least 10% of it will go back into your community, yeah. both with the money yeah. and yourself. Yeah. It's, not, it's, it's more than just giving the money. It's People of visibility right. have to follow the example of Ruby Nasi and give of yourself to the community. It is true. Yeah. But, but there's also another formulation, very simple, very crude. Uh, a couple of years ago in the Forbes magazine of the richest entertainers in the world, uh, if you looked at that list, there were five or six black entertainers headed by Cosby and Oprah and all of that. And roughly they grossed $360 million that year. Okay, now for every dollar grossed, an agent always gets 10%. That meant that somebody got $36 million servicing the needs of those people. How we need to make available to, to our young people access to that $36 million. We've got to come up with a way whereby we not only do the thing and get the money, we've got to sequester a part of that for our own. Affirmative action begins at home. This has been really a great conversation. and. We'd like to continue to talk about the legends, R.C. <laughs> Davis and Ruby Dee, but as uh, you both have so beautifully articulated, uh, the past is prologue, and yes. we need to know our history in order to look forward to our future. Amen. Glad to have Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee on African American Legends today.